welcome to the Formula Botanica Green Beauty Conversations podcast. If you don't know who we are, we're the online and award-winning organic cosmetic science school, and you can find out more information on us over at formulabotanica.com. This week, we're talking about branding, which is a subject that comes up a lot in our online forums amongst our students and graduates. How do I brand? What is branding? Today, we're talking with Rob from The Design Co. And we're covering Branding 101, all the branding basics, all the information you need to get started. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, Rob. Hello. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Welcome to the Formula Botanica podcast. So today, Rob and I are going to be talking about the top 10 tips on branding for beginners. It's a bit of a mouthful, yes. but I'm sure you're going to find it interesting. But before we launch right into that, let's hear a little bit about you, Rob, about your business, The Design Co, and how you got into design. I've been in the print and design industry for seven years since I left university. I used to work for a small print and design bureau, which gave me the opportunity to to meet small to medium-sized businesses and working there as both a senior designer and an account manager gave me the best of both worlds. So I understand the business side of design and I also understand the value of having something that just looks nice. You know, I did that for six years and a year ago, I decided to take a step down from that job and take the leap of faith as everyone does at some point and start their own business and scared and, you know, didn't know where the money was going to come from and got a little studio space in Nottingham City Centre, which was great and gave me the opportunity to meet even more small to medium sized businesses. And it's really given me the opportunity in the past year to work with clients to build visual identities and branding that that really represents what they actually do. And I quite like enjoying working with working with the client together. You know, it's not me telling you what you should have. It's how you can work with them to create something that they love as well. They've actively had a part in it. It's it's their logo. Each step of the processes that we go through is something they get involved. The client's involved yeah. with it. And then at the end, they take a step back when we're finished and they love it. Yeah. That's what it's all about. It's not about the money. It's about just helping other businesses reach their true potential with their visual brand. Nice. So I guess I guess that way the, the client gets a chance to be creative as well with you. Yeah. No matter who you are, you always enjoy looking at colours, yeah. you know, thinking, oh, I think that really suits what we do. And sometimes if a neon pink is put on the table, it, it's not the right thing to choose. But you can work around it and ultimately you end up with the right colours, the right tone of voice, and you end up creating an amazing story that goes with the brand as well. Everyone enjoys working on it. It's the stuff that you wish you could spend all day doing. And I'm yeah. lucky enough to have the opportunity to do it. No, you're already making me want to work with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we get lots of people at Formula Botanica who are wanting to start a brand. You know, they've yeah. done the course, they've got their products, and then they're like, okay, what next? I need, you know, a great logo. I need colors, all those things we were just talking about. So let's talk, let's start talking about our top 10 tips. Yeah. Okay, right. So, I think the first thing to talk about is is actually what is a brand because a lot of people get get confused about what that is. It's it's a really overused word at the moment, which everyone's like, "Got to get your branding on point." It might sound like a basic question, however, it's something that most businesses do get wrong. Obviously, today that's what we're going to be doing in the uh, this top ten tips. So you might not be aware of this, but a well loved and recognised brand is the most valuable asset yeah. a company owns. It's a common mistake that branding is just a logo or is some simply a set of adverts that you send out infrequently. When the reality is your brand is the overall preconception that your business has on your existing customers, your new customers, potential customers, everyone, you know, that, that is what your brand is. That sounds really out there, but that is what it is. Obviously from saying that every business does have a brand. Some people are aware of that and some people aren't. It isn't something that should be left to form on its own. You know, you should have complete control over it. And ultimately, it can influence people to either engage with your business or to instantly have a prejudice against it. Listeners might be wondering, you know, what does that all mean? It sounds all a bit, you know, everywhere, but we will explain it all. 
No, no, I'm okay. I'm okay at the moment. It, it's making sense so far. <laughs> <laughs> so let, 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 let's start with the first point. It, it, it's the longest of all the points, but it, it's important that you look at this in the early stages of the business before you get too far into the process of developing the brand. So let's start with number one, which is called before you choose your name. Your company name is, is a vital asset to your business that massively contributes to its overall success. If chosen correctly, it can conjure up that image in your head of what your brand actually is just by saying the name. So I think you have to question, do you think Nike would have been as successful if it was called something like advanced sports clothing? No, I, I don't think it would have been. So choosing your company name is normally what people, when starting a business, decide, decide to jump to when, when they're starting it. And they tend to spend a few hours just debating about a name, and then they go with what feels sounds best. It's the, the big mistake here is that there is a couple of steps that you have to do that if you've never run a business or started a business before, you might overshadow. So the first step that I would do before you even consider names or jumping into the designing of logos or looking at which nice, you know, sexy bottle that you want to have is, is just spending the time researching your target market and, and looking at all your competition. I always recommend, especially when you're a startup and money's tight, just find a bit of space in your house or in your office and just put a table up on the wall of all the different, mm -hmm. all of the different competition that you have. Firstly, looking at your immediate competition when you start trading. So other startups, businesses that have been established for a year or two years, and then go up to the, the weird term, the dream competition that you ultimately want to be facing five, 10 years down the line. Just put it up on the wall. I, I always recommend printing it out, putting it up. Don't have it on a computer screen. Put it up somewhere where you're going to see it every day and just keep looking at it. And always examine the colors they use, the overall voice, how they word their, their marketing how they use photography and how okay. they pitch their products to you as a customer. Once you've done that, you have to then take a step back and think, okay, how am I actually going to stand out from that? You know, you don't want, you don't want to literally pick one that you absolutely love and you wish your business was that business and just replicate how they market it, the way that they, the wording they use, because ultimately when you do that, it's just, your business is going to be living in the shadow of the more established business and it's just a horrible place to be. In doing that, your sort of standout point, the technical term is USP for people who've never used it, a unique selling point. I think an absolutely amazing USP is with Tom's shoes. Love it. You know, so the way that they've pitch their product is they give a new pair of shoes to a child for every pair that you purchase. This gives their customers, the reassurance okay. that their purchase is doing some good. And on the other side of that, it gives the customer the excuse to make the purchase. It, it's just brilliant, you know, but don't obviously don't fear, you know, you don't have to come up with a completely new world changing idea. Putting a unique spin on an existing concept is, is a great way to make your business stand out. After you feel comfortable with your market research and you feel that you've established a really strong, unique selling point, you can start to consider it, consider your business name. Like yes. before, this does deserve some time and patience. I, I would really recommend not doing this on your own because you ultimately, if anyone, we're all the same, you'll get this one idea, you'll focus on it, and that's the only thing you can think, think of, and you get tunnel vision on it. And I, I just recommend getting a few people, some people that are part of the project and, you know, are understanding what you're doing and some people that are outside of it and you explain what you want to do. Really recommend that. Then spend an evening all together just coming up with different names. Some will be stupid. Some will be the best name ever. And just list them down. I mean, if, if you really push the boat out, you'll, you'll get a hundred names, you know, but I'd recommend get about 50 names again, like before, write it on a bit of paper. Don't, Use a computer, write a bit of paper, put it on the wall. And then from that point, spend an hour or so away from it, then come back okay. and then all together pick your top 10. Pick top 10 names that really represent what you want to do and just embody your USP. That's the fun bit. And then you have to do the checks. So you've got these 10 names and a lot of people don't consider this when they're starting their business and it, it's 
crucial. You have to do these checks. So what you have to do firstly, if you're in the UK, there is different organizations in different countries that yes. do, do the same. In the UK, you have Companies House. Check on their website, gov.uk, and just search for Companies House. Really simple to do. Check on there to see if, if there's a name there's already an existing company with that name for each of the 10, do it for each of the 10, spend the time. If there's a company with that name existing, I wouldn't go for it. And yes. then also on gov.uk, check for the trademark. Big thing, check your trademark. You do not want to have a name. It means bad. it's bad. Because <laughs> ultimately, if, if you do end up picking a name that's already been trademarked and it's already a registered company and you get further down the line, you've spent thousands on branding, you've spent thousands getting your bottles designed, your formulation, you've got, you know, sorted your distribution out. And then yeah. as soon as you feel settled yeah. and you get a letter, a cease and desist letter and it kills it, your, your business is in essence dead because you've, you've wasted all your money. It is waste. So that is an easy check that if you do with each of the 10 names, will say will save potentially the death of your business in about a year. Yeah. And I think that's a really, really important point, because I think a lot of people don't consider that. And it will probably happen in most countries. If something's already trademarked and it already has that name, it's more than likely you will get a cease and desist letter from a lawyer who says you need to stop using and you do. It's quite simple. You would have to stop if it's already trademarked and already being used. Yeah. And if you've got a warehouse full of products, a great product, you know, it's all waste. You've got to relabel it. And if you've got the funds, it's not cheap to do. But if you have got the funds and the trademark isn't there, look into getting it trademarked as soon as you can to prevent someone else doing the same. You know, I, I would recommend doing that. Once you've done that check and you've checked all of your 10 names, I would then move on to the next step, which is check if the domain name is available, as in for your website, for your email address. But by this point where you get to the point of looking at domain names, normally I would say the 10 has been whittled down to about five. All of a sudden you'll think, yeah, L'Oreal. Yeah, that name hasn't gone. And then you end, it just, you end up coming up with names that are already taken. Um, so definitely what I would do once you've got your now probably around five names that you've got on your wall, check your domain names. This again, for people who've never done it before is an easy enough thing to do. Go onto websites such as one and onecom or GoDaddy. Everybody's heard of GoDaddy and they have a search engine and just literally put in your, your potential business name. Yeah. Just put it in and you want to get the dream domain name, which is your company name. Dot com. That is the dream. You know, everyone wants to get that. Or dot co at UK. Dot com is the one that you really want. I, I would also recommend at this point, normally the name is taken. But what I would recommend not doing is you'll get lured into your company name, natural organic skincare company dot com. And it ends up being this massive name. Don't do it. it if just put yourself into your client's shoes would you like to spend five seconds typing out a domain name to realize you've missed out a letter? Nobody wants to do it. And you're just going to lose people that are at the first step of just checking out your website. You know, you, you don't want to do that. You want to get the dream where it's just your name.com. As a word of warning, if you've never done this before, you'll probably go and say go daddy and you'll, you'll put your business name in there and it'll say it's unavailable. Then you'll Google it, see if it's available and it, it'll come up as under private sale people and it'll say please contact us and it'll end up being that the domain name's three thousand pounds and obviously it would be amazing if you could get that but i would seriously reconsider the name if you can't it, if it's going to cost you that if you've got the funds to do that do it you know it's great you know it's a big decision but i think to scale your business long term to get that niche name is is crucial so once you've done that 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 search and hopefully you've managed to find the name that is your name.co.uk or your name, whatever country you're from, you're there. You know, if you've got four names at that point from your 50 that you think, yeah, it hits all of the points. You've got a great USP. You've got, you know, that the name reflects USP. It reflects what you want the business to be. 
and you've got an absolutely amazing domain name to go with it, settle on that, get that domain name, and that is your business name. You've, you've sorted, and then you can move on to the rest. But at least now you've got a solid understanding of potentially who your target market is, your selling point, and you've got a name solid. It's brilliant. That That's a good place to be. Fabulous. So let's just go quickly back to that point you made about sometimes when you search for a domain and it says under private sale. So I think what happens is that people and companies buy up domain names. Yeah. And then try and sell them back. So if you see something like that, that's that's pretty much what people have. Done. And it happens quite a lot, unfortunately. The domain names are, are money in the modern world and they're worth quite a lot. I mean, a perfect example is my domain name. I looked at the Design Co or the Design .co.uk because I thought it had a nice ring to it, but that was already taken. And then it was going to be something like four thousand pounds to buy a domain name. And you just think, as a startup, and money's tight, you, there's no way on earth you could ever afford it. So I ended up finding the design.co, which is a new domain, which was perfect to play on words, and it's quite quirky for a, you know a design agency. And that one, unbelievably, was seven hundred pounds. So it still cost me quite a lot, but. It saved me having that really convoluted name name. It's nice and clean. And it was worth that for me at the time, big investment, but it's not a massive investment. So I just, just be aware of that. Just definitely be aware of that. So moving on to point two. Okay. So obviously before we get onto point two, I just want to make an emphasis that like mentioned before, the brand is so much more than just the logo and the corporate identity. It's it's how your business interacts with the outside world, which, which leads me on to point two, which is their reputation. So your reputation is is a big part of your brand. It's the result of what you do and what you don't do. Your reputation can either be your best friend or it, it can be your worst enemy, especially when you're trying to grow the business. A, a good example of a positive reputation would be if if your skincare business has stood the test of time and you've got orders coming in constantly, people love your product and trust that every time they order, they get the same great quality and they enjoy the extra little details that you put into it, such as using tissue paper in the packaging or a little handwritten note just to say thank you. You know, and, and word, word travels fast and people even say to their friends, you need to buy more of their exfoliator. It works well and smells amazing. This is, is the company having a great rep reputation and is, is the best foundation to build upon. Your customers are market, marketing the business in for you. It's, it's the dream. The opposite of that, a bad reputation, is when your business is known for being inconsistent or people always saying, the staff are always so unhappy on the phone. Or, or even... If you put those little details in to start with, such as putting the tissue paper in, and then it slowly starts to disappear. And then because you're busy, you start just putting stuff quickly in the box. And people who were with you and loyal to you starting off begin to feel as if, oh, I'm not really valued anymore. You know, and then they utter their dreaded words. They're not like they used to be. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I hate that. You don't want to be that. And it's really difficult to shake that off. You, you can do it. You just need to be consistent with whatever you change with. So I guess it's best to be consistent from the beginning. And I, can, I guess you can only yeah. improve a good reputation by doing you know different things or adding in different touches. But yeah. to try and well, you like sort of come back from bad reputation or yeah. bad feedback is more difficult. So it's better to put the effort in. Oh yeah, especially if you're just starting up the business. Start as you mean to carry on. I mean, that's easier said than done. I understand what it's like when you're, you're spinning all these plates trying to run a business, but don't show how crazy it is behind the scenes, you know, that you are trying to, you're working 13 hour shifts and stuff like that. Try and keep everything smiles, happy, and the way that you want your business to, to, to look to the outside world, because it'll keep people coming back. So that moves us on to the third point, which is, your employees. Now, not everybody is going to be lucky enough to have employees. Or when I say this, I mean everyone. So that includes yourself if you're if you're working on your own. Ultimately, the people in the business do actually make the business and they make the brand. They all add their own little character to it. And ultimately, if if your business has an outgoing feel to it, you're less likely to hire people that don't have the same sort of 
ideology, you know, same ethos, you're not going to do it. And it's likewise that obviously when you reach the point that you're hiring a member of staff, it, it can make or break the business. You know, having an employee working with you that has a poor work ethic, especially when it's a small team, can create tension in the business. And it makes it both a difficult place to work in. The customers can sense that, you know, you know, when you're answering the phone, they can sense that you're stressed. So if, if you do get unfortunately stuck in this scenario, just talk to that member of staff and politely see if, if there's anything you can do to make their job better, if there's anything that you can help with just to make them feel more motivated about the business. Because ultimately, the dream scenario is to have members of staff working with you in an environment where everyone's happy to turn up every day. It's the dream, you know, if yeah. only everyone could get to that point, but that's the dream. Yeah. So also, the big thing with staff is that Knowledge of the brand is key. You know, it tends to be that, especially when you're just starting up as a director or as, as the owner, you get stuck in the boardroom and that's the only place that you talk about it. That's all you talk about, the development of the business, as everyone who is involved should be aware of ultimately what the goals and the plans of the business are, both short and long term. So, so it's like you spend thousands of pounds on an amazing ad campaign. It looks great. But you don't tell your employees about it. You know, you tell them last minute and give this half-hearted explanation about what it is and they don't really get why you're doing it. And you expect them to be as motivated about it as you are and be able to sell it. And the last thing you want to do is spend all that money, all that time and effort getting this great campaign. And then when your staff go out to sell it or when they answer the phone and your customer goes, oh, I've seen this campaign, it looks great. They're inconsistent. Yeah. I think you can see a trend with consistency yeah. coming through. Or they don't really know what they're saying. They're like, yeah, I think, I yeah. think that's how it's working. Or, oh, Yeah. And then they say something that's not right. And we've all been in yeah. that scenario where you think, but somebody else told me something yes. different and you just get annoyed and it just makes it look bad. Yeah. So just keep everyone in the loop. It's exciting. They're working there. They actively want to work there. Keep them involved, your team. Yeah, keep everyone in the loop. I think that's a great, great advice. Right, where were we? Number three. So we're on to so, number four. Number four. Yeah. So obviously, we've been talking about consistency, and it's going to be a thread that runs throughout all of this. So number four is your products, especially talking to everyone who's going to be listening to this, which is they're creating a yes. product. That, in essence, is the core of your business. You know, people come to you not to have a chat with you. They come with, come to you to ultimately yeah. buy the product. And that's how the business gets its income. So if if you have a really well-developed, which I'm sure everybody will, product that has been tried and tested and it's proved that it works, then the brand will simply amplify how great yeah. all of it is if all of these points are met. However, again... I must, you know, emphasize the importance of consistency. So you need to make sure that your your customer is confident that they will always get the same quality product. You know, selling an amazing product, but with a poorly designed website will devalue that product. On the other side of that, selling a product that doesn't appeal to your target demographic, yeah. so that your target audience, is more likely to fail no matter how much money you pump into design, you know, designing POS and, and packaging and your website, you need to have a product that you have researched that fits the gap that, that you've decided to fill with your product. Or be careful with that because I've worked with, with firms before where the niche is that small that there's probably only about six people that are yeah. going to actually buy the product. And, I mean, you can do that, but you're going to make life very difficult for yourself. So just really consider the audience that your product is aimed for. Okay, so I think the important point to note here is that the product is not necessarily the brand. Yeah, it's obviously, it's a key part of it. It's, yeah, but it's not yeah. the entire thing. Yeah. I think that's where a lot of people get slightly yeah. confused. So they've designed the product, they have it in like, this is my brand, and it's probably not. It's a part of it. It's just one unit of a, of a whole exactly bunch of units interlinking units if you yeah. wish that together make yeah. the brand exactly yeah and then you're more likely to sell products yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> okay where were we number five point five so it's 
it's an obvious one, but it's um, it's a lot bigger than what what you'd imagine. Yeah, so it's customer service. Your, your customer service is key to creating a trustworthy brand. That's keyword trustworthy. Customer service represents the way that you interact with your customer. So people will just think, okay, this is when they call up and it's on the phone. That's my customer service, but it's not. It's it's how you word your emails. It's it's the copy text on your website, and it's even the way that you greet your client when they come into your office. It's yeah. all customer service, and every little detail matters. So this obviously isn't generic for every business. It all depends on the character and the ethos of the brand you're trying to create. So, for example, you ex- instinctively know that when you go into a place such as Google, you're going to get a completely different experience than going to somewhere like the BMW headquarters. Yeah. Google is going to be a fun environment that's vibrant, bubbling with energy. Yeah. BMW is going to be minimal, professional, to the highest standard. This doesn't happen by mistake. You know, these businesses have crafted their ethos to match the offering to their particular client base. They have understood the importance of the correct use of language and environment, which also applies to, to the, the listeners' business. You know, it, it applies to every business. So think of it like this. Being an e-commerce business will make people think differently of it as compared to a bricks and mortar building where you can go in and go in and visit. I like to think of it that each business is different. So some businesses pitch as being casual. Right. You know, that they are your friend. So a casual business, a casual environment that is not going to appeal to every person. No. It's going to it's going to appeal to a certain type of client as as does a formal environment. Formal environments don't appeal to everyone. You know, which is absolutely fine. You can't please everyone, which is why you picked a target audience in the early stages. You're not trying to target yeah. everyone. That, that's key. I deal with a lot of businesses where I ask, okay, so what's your target audience? And then they, they go, oh, I don't know, everyone between the age of 18 and 50. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's not going to work, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but as soon as you scratch something beneath the surface, you quickly realise that, oh, okay, so you're actually targeting someone who's 20, between 20 and 30, they're women and they're, they're, they're professionals. And so, okay, that really owns it down, you know. And normally they know it. It's just, they want to just everyone. I just want to deal with everyone, you know. I don't want to turn people away, you know. And unfortunately, to be successful with it, you're going to have to do that. <laughs> yeah, at least in the beginning. Yeah, especially with, you know, skincare and beauty. I mean, you see these larger firms where they initially focus with one yeah. target audience and then, They'll branch out and then they'll branch out. And ultimately, they have this massive range. Don't bite off too much. You know, people have this grand idea when they're starting up that I'm going to do a, a, a teenage skincare regime. I'm going to do a men's skincare regime. And it ends up being, and then I'll tear it into age ranges. I'm thinking, wow, how much are you spending on getting all of this made? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you've already got the millions because you've spent it on doing all these <laughs> So just, especially for beginners, just really just focus on your audience. Yeah. Yeah. And then we were talking about customer service. So making sure that your customer service at every level is good because it's not just about, like you say, about how you greet people even. If so, for instance, if you were just an online or an e-commerce, you know, it's going to be the way your website looks, how user friendly it is, um, how responsive it is. Do you have a chat box? How easy is it for people to reach you? Do you have opt-ins on your website? Do you have, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, all, all of that is customer service. And I think that people don't always think about that. And um, the usability of your site is essentially. Oh, definitely. Yeah. A customer service tool. In the industry, we call yeah. it touch points. You know, each single touch point. And you've got to remember that it's normally 12 touch points and then you'll get a sale. So you have to interact with them 12 times normally before they'll even can okay. consider buying it. So this can be through a mail shot or it can be that they've seen an advert on Facebook or, you know, you've sent a letter to their business or they've heard somebody else talking about your product. It's each little point that you've interacted with them needs to be consistent. And that is very vaguely, it it is your customer service. You know, 
I think having those uh, chat now boxes on yeah. the website is brilliant because you, you're yeah. always there. And I love it because, especially those, is you can say when you're not there. And it, I would recommend getting those on your website. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's so easy for a customer who's got an instant question to yeah. be able to to ask something immediately like, you know, when is your product going to be for sale? Or is it suitable for me? I have acne or you know, how can I return this? I'm based in America and I want to buy it from from England. Or, you know, they're able to ask an instant question, get an instant response, and then, you know, carry on. And I think I think all of us have been on those websites where you're like, oh, how do I add this to the basket? Oh, I can't quite see where this is. Oh, how do you actually check out? And then you just get fed up. So you don't do it. And yeah, so I think I think I guess we have to think about customer service slightly different than just how you how you speak to your customers face to face because we, we might not be speaking to them face to face in the same kind of the older retail environments where it's slightly different. That's the thing. Everything's changed so quickly that people do get stuck in that traditional sense, don't they? Where it's like, okay, initially people think, okay, I've got to get my products into John Lewis. You know, and that's what people think. Where as reality is now obviously you've got the world of Amazon, which yeah. has changed everything, and you've got e commerce. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can now do e-commerce website for for a thousand pounds. You can have a website selling products that 15, 20 years ago, I wouldn't even dream yeah. of it. You'd be going to, to markets trying to sell it, you know, in the early days and you'd dream of getting it in John Lewis and the world is, you've got a completely global reach thanks to having an e-commerce website. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, just think about what we're doing today. I mean, you're based in Nottingham. I'm in London. Yeah. Before this sort of technology, you know, that links us via yeah. 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 audio, we wouldn't necessarily be working together. Yeah. Or a long but, yeah, drive. Yeah, or a very long drive to achieve, <laughs> to achieve a, yeah. a short podcast recording. <laughs> it's a great time to set up a business. And it's an exciting time as well, because all it takes is for you to get a few influencers on, say, Instagram to just plug your product and you're done you know you are doing well you know for people to get interest people it becomes a, a well-known name or an advertising campaign that goes viral you know that just wouldn't have happened it was the big boys yeah. that would do that 20 years ago as now everyone has the chance and it's such an exciting time to be yeah. part of it i mean i was speaking to a student of ours that set up a business and she does consultations online and you know, how, what, 10, 20 years ago, that wouldn't have happened. You wouldn't have been able to do an online consultation. So she has clients all over the world, and yet she's based in one country. It's amazing. <laughs> it is, it's you amazing. Know, so she's able to help people in, you know, Japan, in China, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, and she's based in America. So before, she would have had to travel, but now, obviously, you know, through, through being able to talk via Skype or Zoom, or whatever she's able to offer her services you know globally without having to travel yeah. all right so we're on point six we've covered a bit of expectations but i can go into more detail about it so obviously talking about expectations the biggest thing with with your product when you start your business is you don't want to oversell your product we have all at some point stretched the truth we, we all have but in business, you quickly found out when you don't deliver on what you promised. So I just wouldn't do it. Um, per people just prefer it when you're completely honest and just describe it as it is. And ultimately, if your product's great, it'll sell itself. It'll, it'll do fine. You know, if anything, this is what I personally think is that you should slightly undersell it. This doesn't mean to make it sound bad in the description. You know, it's try. And make it so when when they receive your product, they get slightly more than what they expected. I mean, for example, I mentioned earlier that some people can wrap their product in tissue paper. They'll put a lovely bit of ribbon that goes around it, and they'll they'll write a handwritten note that says "Good choice," you know, "Thank you for your order," you know, and then you know it, it just makes the customer feel like they're valued. But then that little icing on the cake is that they, when they take the product out of the box. They notice that they've got a ten pound off your next order voucher. You've just knocked it out of the park. You know you're doing great. So the customer feels as if they're valued and they're getting an additional bonus just for shopping with you. You know, and it, it's great. So I understand that obviously certain businesses will not have the time to lovingly hand wrap everything, but you get the point that it's the little details that you add to it that just 
exceed what they're expecting or just at least meet the expectations of what they think they're getting. Okay. All right. Fabulous expectations. So number seven is the actions you make. This is trying to think of the bigger picture when you step away from the business. So, so your business will have a presence both online and depends on how you've structured the business. You might have a local presence. So part of your brand is is to do acts that don't necessarily benefit the sales of products. So a perfect example of this would be charity work, going on a fun run and having a T-shirt with your, your name, your business name on there. It really does highlight your business in a good light. And people remember that and you'll get positive PR from that. And I'd recommend doing it for the sake of a bit of time. It's worth its weight in gold, you know, and even if it was something like doing a talk, like, like I'm doing now with you, you know, it just shows, it shows that the the business is taking that one step further than just trying to push a sale at someone. It's there's people in it and people do buy off people at the end of the day. Yeah. Anything that can reflect, make your business be reflected in a positive way is going to really impact your brand on a good, a good yeah. way. Okay, fabulous. Yeah, so it's just thinking about things that you could do that's not necessarily directly attached to your business, but still yeah. present it in a good light. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, we want, we want to do a series, a podcast series on businesses that give back. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. that people that are donating, you know, percentages of sales to different charities and different things. And yeah. Um, it's a very interesting concept, um, and it's one. Well, it's even might be going off on a bit of a tangent, but a lot of business are trying to get inbound marketing. So instead of you trying to force people to look onto your website, it's to get people to actively want to go on your website, and this can be through you know uh, blog posts is a big one. Vlogs is another one that's developed over the past few years. Obviously, this takes a lot of time and effort, but I would recommend doing it especially if you're an expert in your field where people would want to get some influence off you. I'd recommend doing that, right? And like this, for me, I work in branding. So I will do a top 10 tips on branding that I'm just happy to just give people. Businesses that are open to giving things away look better than trying to do the hard sell. And you're more inclined to come back and have a look if you feel as if you're not being forced to buy something. No, Nobody wants that, Yeah. especially if you're British. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think we've all we've all had the hard sell. Yeah. You know, we've all been harassed by phone calls. We've you know, yeah. sometimes when you walk in the shop and you get three or four people come up to you immediately and you feel a bit like, Oh, I just want to yeah. get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you want to have a little look and figure out some questions that I yeah. have and yeah, 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 it can be a bit full on. Okay. All right. So lots to think about already, but we're moving on to point eight, which is logo. Yes. So we're actually moving on to the visuals now, which is where if if you're starting a business, this is where the design co would step in. Obviously, we can help out making a consider your demographic and thinking about bigger picture of your business. But this is normally where we would step in. That's not to say you have to come with us. It's okay. It's just normally this is where a designer would step in. So as mentioned before... A couple of times your logo isn't your brand but it is the key element to it it's it's what i call the visual representation of what you do it's the first thing that people normally see and associate with it's a vital element to your business this doesn't mean that you should list out everything that you do on your logo because i do have people that want to cram everything onto your logo that you do you do male skincare you do women's skincare you, you know you're organic you don't do that Keep it minimal. The shorter, the better. None of the big names that you think of have massive company names with everything no. in the logo. Just... Nike. Exactly. And that... Four letters and a tick. Exactly. And <laughs> obviously, we all dream of having a business that ha is that big. But why not think on that sort of level? So I've got a set of rules that I like to follow when setting up a logo design. And I always talk to clients about this when we're at this point. So... People always tend to have a rough idea of what they're after. And I like to just clear that off and we'll start on a fresh, you know, just start completely fresh. So I've got six rules and I'll just list them out. So a good logo identifies and it doesn't describe what you do, which is what I've just said. Also, a key point is if you're having problems with the business, the logo will not solve that problem if you okay. change it. So also it should be obviously visually engaging. A lot of people don't think of this, but when... 
designing your logo, you want to create this intricate little d design and it looks, it does look beautiful, but then they want to put it on a bottle and it, it's, it's sort of five, 10 mil. It's too intricate. It, it, it's just not going to scale down well. You know, great if it's on a billboard, it looks amazing, but then you've got to scale it down. You've just got to consider that. So we've said Nike, that swoosh, the swoosh works well and everyone can recognize it at both sides. From a print point of view, if I put a print cap on, is that if you do have a small, intricate little logo, you can do it. But as soon as you go to print and you want that foil blocked and you want it looking really nice mm -hmm. and sexy on the front of your bottle, it'll bleed in and it'll end up becoming this blob and the printer will tell you that it's not going to print well. And by that point, it's too late. You know, you'll end up either having to alter it and it'll look different to everything else or... Or you're going to have to change it, you know. So I think it's best just to consider where it's going to be applied yeah. in the early stages when you're making it, which obviously means, which is point five, okay. it should be an illustration. And lastly, always think that your logo is the foundation of the identity. Okay. It starts from there and works up. So I've mentioned point two. I will get through this quickly, but I've mentioned point two that it can't solve all your problems. I have dealt, this is from experience where I've dealt with clients where they're going through difficult times and they've got legal issues against the business and it's tarnished the brand. And it, it, it's, the name is in tatters, so you, you just can't use it anymore. So they come to me and they're like, what a new logo. And we'll, we'll, make, we'll make the problem go away. And it just doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work. You have to solve the problem. There's ways to get around it. But if, if, if it's a really bad issue, such as like the trademark infringement, you're going to have to change it. You can't just change the name because yeah. people will associate the, the icon and the, the, the word mark that goes with it. You're going to have to change it all, really. So stepping away from the negativity, I like to think of the logo as being the smiling face of the business. You know, it, it, you know and you have to consider that when you're developing the products is that if, if your products and your business is family friendly and you've got this logo that's dark and really abstract, mm -hmm. it, it's just not going to do you any favours. You know, it's just, it's worth taking a step back and just reflecting on your business and as an entirety and just reevaluating whether it's working for you or not. Yeah. And I think, I think we just need to be mindful because everyone's like, oh, it's not working. I've done, I've done everything wrong, you know, but you know, reevaluation is a very, very positive tool in your toolbox, yeah. constantly reevaluating and say, it was a brilliant idea, but it's not going to work for this particular yeah. project that we're doing. Let's have a rethink. Let's still stick with the yeah. core ideas, but let's, you know, reevaluation is not anything to be ashamed of or, or, you know, it's, it's a value, valuable. People think it's set in stone, don't they? I mean, in the early days, I got really, but working on my own in the early days, it was, I got stuck working. Everyone says this, you know, working in the business. So I'm, I get stuck working on briefs, working on website design and everything like that. After talking to a mentor, they told me, okay, take one day out a week. And I'm thinking, I can't take it. Yeah. I can't do it. I actually can't. There's not enough time. <laughs> Make the time. Take a day out a week or even an afternoon, Friday afternoon when you, that, typing that email takes four times longer. Stop then, you know, plan the time, spend an afternoon or a day a week and work on the business. So taking a step back and just reevaluating whether, you know, is an issue with cash flow, how are you going to sort that out? Is the branding working? You know, is the logo right? It, let's work on that. The business deserves that time because otherwise you'll end up blinking and a year or two will have gone down the line and you've stagnated. Everything has stagnated and you're just churning out the same thing. You're stressed, you're pulling your hair out and just to give it some time. Yeah. And I think going back to your first point where you said about, you know, getting input on, you know, your name and, you know, brainstorm with your friends, your family, your colleagues, whatever, whoever you can. I mean, input is so valuable because often it can just make yeah. you see things from a slightly different perspective. Or like you say, when you get that tunnel vision about something, you just need someone to give you a little yeah. tap on the shoulder and say, well, hang on, have you considered yeah. this angle? Or, you know, suddenly you're like, oh, yeah. well, <laughs> that's, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it, I find it, I, I do it all the time. I mean, I'm a fan of going to the pub and sitting down and just talking, you know, and it, I've got a group of people that we all do that. And we all just bounce ideas off each other. And I will get such tunnel vision on a certain idea. And I think I've got to do it. The business is going to fail if I don't do it. 
And then as soon as I actually say it out loud to somebody else, you think, God, that's the most stupid idea I've ever heard. Yes. <laughs> but in your mind, you've, you've planned how much it's going to cost, where you're going to get it shipped to and all this. And it's like, it's good to talk because, I mean, completely outside of branding, just from running a business, it's so lonely when you're on your own. Yeah. You get stuck. I mean, you, you could be surrounded by people, but running your business is so lonely. I think just talking to people, frankly, is is great, you know, and it, it helps you grow as well as the business grow. So I'd recommend it, even if it once a week, it's all it takes. Yeah, take some time out. I mean, there's lots of different ways that people can, can you know, now that we've, we're talking about the modern world, you can go yeah. on Facebook, you can try and start a local you know, entrepreneurs meeting or, 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 you know, I know, I know in our area in, in London, they've got lots of different business meetings that you can oh, attend yeah. where it's just local business owners that all want to get together and just yak about, you know, what yeah. is running a business or, or yeah. aspects that they're struggling with. And just because it's not the same business as yours doesn't mean that you won't get, you know, valuable input from people. So it's, yeah. Keep an open mind on it. Yeah. An open mind is definitely needed. Right. Okay. So logo we are nearly there, nearly there. <laughs> we, are nearly nearly there. there. we are number nine right so we are at point yeah. nine which leads from your logo design so i mentioned earlier that uh, you start with your logo design and then you build on from that which in the industry we call the visuals so this is all the visual elements of your business so this is your logo and the guidelines that go with it uh, the visuals for the business are items such as your website, your brochures, any form of advertisement or POS, you know, the business stationery if you opt for that, email signatures, anything that involves someone designing it, that that is your visual. So if you're lucky enough to have a brand manual or also called brand guidelines, which is it, it basically itemizes how you should lay out your type, you know, what type of language you should be using, color palette, you know. The, the yummy stuff that I tend to do. Yeah, I'm just going to interject here and say how valuable it is to try and have one of some brand guidelines. We we've just got them at Formula Botanica, and they are it is it is, it, is, it solves so many problems when you're dealing with other companies, other people. Yeah, anything you've just got here is how it works. Yeah, in a PDF document. It, it, fish bash box. It's amazing, and, but it also works internally. I think quite well. So it's like if yeah. if the secretary is is sending an email out or sending a letter out, it just gives them the guidelines. Okay, your logo should be here. You know, you need to word it like this, and it all consistently looks the same because that's the perk of a brand manual. If you do go somewhere else, you know, if you're working with an agency, a design agency, and then you opt to go somewhere else because it's not working out, it happens. As soon as you move over, you can hit the ground running. You've got the brand manual, and it it looks as if nothing's changed. You know, these can cost quite a bit of money to, to set out if you opt for a full brand manual, but you don't need that necessarily. I mean, starting off, if you, you're working with a designer and you just say, can I have a spec sheet? And that will just give you fonts that you use, the point size you should use, your basic colors that you use and how you should be using photography if you opt for photography in there. Really nice and simple. Shouldn't cost the world, but I'd recommend getting it. Okay. Definitely. I was going to mention about how, um, obviously the brand manual stops the dreaded where you receive an email from, from a company and the, you know, the, the logo stretched. Oh, so you're using yes. Comic Man, yeah. And you just think, oh, yes. I, 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 everyone does it. And you think, what, what's <laughs> cracking off there? You know, and it, it just, it, it gives people trust in the business and, you know, and, and that's what you need. You need your clients to trust, trust you before they become loyal to you. You know, you need it. This is the only time where not standing out is the best scenario. Yeah. You know, you want it to look like nothing at all has, has changed at all. And I've got, I've got a good example of this is that if, if you was to go to McDonald's and you, you've gone to the drive through and you're looking at the menu and straight away you notice that the menu is in a dark blue and it was all written in Comic Sans in, instead of their, their trademark red you just wonder what's yeah. happening it, it is exactly the same with with your business you know always consider that so and now going back to the point that we've been making throughout the whole 10 points is consistency it's got to be consistent and it's got to be basic i mean i think we've all received those emails with the random signature and then a massive quote from someone in like pink floaty writing and it just you know you get you're just like oh what yeah, oh, you know, you don't even oh, want to. It sinks, it. doesn't it? Yeah, 
<laughs> and you think, why did I even open it? I should have just deleted it. Which is bad, and you don't want your stuff to be like that, where they go, oh, I'm going to delete that. They want them to open it and think, oh, wow, it looks smart. I know, and I, and I think that we have to be real- realistic about what people's inboxes are like nowadays. Yeah. I mean, my inbox can get crazy, where I, where I get so many emails that there have been some where I've thought, I'm going to have to delete this yeah. because, I, you know, you, you can't read it properly. It's all over the screen. It's, yeah. it's too bright. Or the fonts, like you say, I mean, there was obviously a trend for Comic Sans at some point. Oh, yeah. <laughs> dark time. Dark. <laughs> the dark time for, for font design. But, oh. you know, you, and, and interestingly, we went to an event and there was a, a well-known beauty blogger that was saying, you know, she gets thousands of emails over a week. And, and if they are written in a certain way or they look strange or whatever, she will delete them and you won't get a reply. Mm. So to have a consistent, you know, well thought out font design structure yeah. to your emails, to your signatures, everything is definitely worth it, not just from customer service, but when you're interacting with people like in the PR industry or bloggers or, you know, vloggers or whatever. Yeah. Well, it, yeah, it's funny you mention that because... We had an advertising campaign at, at Design Co a couple of months back where I sat back and I reflected on, you know, how other firms are doing it, you know, and it's all yeah. e-shots because of cost. It keeps it cheap. And at that point, I thought, okay, let, let's – obviously, we do design and print. I thought we'll take a step back and we'll do a, a, a direct mail, you know, a, but not a cheap, nasty, horrible flyer through the letterbox sort of thing. We'll do something that's a really nice fold, uncoated stock, and, you know, we put a bit of chocolate on there as well, just to, you know, to get people reading. Everyone likes a bumpy envelope. Yeah. You're never going to not open a bumpy no. envelope. You're going to open it because you think, what is it? And, you know, a bit of green and black's chocolate in there. Just, yeah. To, yeah. just to sweeten the deal. I did that as well as, as doing an e-shop just to see. I mean, I, I cherry picked some, some clients to send them to and, you know, clients that you want to get. It amazed me how the response for the printed version of it was so much better. And I got more of a genuine response than what I got with the direct mail. So for me, it feels as if it's taken a little bit of a step back, especially when it's more premium, to the the tactile. I've always loved tactile. And everyone loves to feel something. As You don't want to end up being that that business that's just deleted or goes into the spam. You know, Try and think outside of the box when you're doing your, your marketing. Yeah, yeah. No, it's all it's all good information. Right, final point number ten. Final point, right? Your story. So your story. So it, it really is a commonly overused term, like the word brand. But it really is important that you have a solid understanding of the business's story. What what made you start the business? You, you might think that your product will, will just sell itself, but the story that behind it is what captivates the customer. Looking at the skincare industry, there's many great examples of amazing stories that really conjure up, you know, the emotions that make, you know, persuade you to make the purchase. We we all instantly know certain firms. For me, look at Lush. Look at Burt's Bees. You know, they have perfected their story, which is why they're so big. You know, and from humble beginnings, they're now selling such a genuine product. It is. You do think it's genuine that makes you think that they're still a small business when in reality they're huge, you know, they're massive, but you can't help being swept up in the story of yeah. Bert getting the honey from the bees hive, you know, in reality he isn't involved in it anymore, you know, and it, it it's such a lovely story to get swept on up in, you know, and once you've done your market research in the early stages, you'll realise that there's a story there. There always is. People always think that you have to have this really convoluted story about hiking the hills of Nepal, you know, and all this. And it doesn't have to be like that. It can be quite simple. You can always put a unique spin on what sounds like quite a generic story. You you can do that, you know, and it can be a personal story. Or if you don't want to do that, it can be a story about the product. Like I said, you know, every business is different. However... The key point that I want you to take away from, you know, examining your story is that you have to make that emotional connection, you know, and, you know, it has to be something that people Mm -hmm. can, well, your target audience relates to. So you have to embellish the points. And I've done two little examples just, just to prove a point. So I've got two options. 
Okay. So when writing your story, it could be one of these two. So you've got all of our organic products are sourced from the Mediterranean. It's to the point. Or you could say all of our in organic ingredients are handpicked from the heart of the sun-soaked Mediterranean. Only the finest herbs and spices are chosen by our team of botanical experts, purposely chosen to bring that out that perfect aroma, making you feel like you're on a faraway shore. It's a bit more long-winded, but it instantly makes you feel as if, oh, I wish I was there. I know, I want to go on holiday and be there with the perfectly hand-picked botanical. Yeah, oh, you know, I really want to be there. You know, it, it's something that I'm not even doing it. I'm excited about that. It's obviously, in cer certain scenarios, the first line, perfect. It's what you need. You know, that's what you'll put on the bottle. You know, that's that's great. But you need to really just squeeze. I mean, that's just talking about the product and what's in there. You know, yeah. and that doesn't necessarily need an expert to do that. You can try that yourself. I mean, we help do that. But you, you can do that yourself just by amplifying and just really squeezing out what you can from. And, and that's it. I, I, you know. I think in doing that is it really amplifies the effectiveness of the brand by just bringing out what's really happening with your product in the story. Obviously, we've gone through it all the way through. Yeah. And uh, the last bonus point, number 11, bonus. is consistency. Okay. <laughs> right. just if you can... None of that, none of the other 10 points matter if you don't keep consistent, you know, keep yes. it a consistent plan, you know, and if you do stick to these 10 points, 11 points, you know, it gives you a good step up to hopefully having a good success for your business. Yeah. And I guess, yeah, it's worth putting the time and effort into thinking about these things yeah. beforehand um, because you don't Definitely. want to be mopping things up while you're, and then, and then going back to the other point, then you're working in the business all the time and then on, yeah. on the background. Okay. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> we got through our 11 tips. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Rob from the design co for joining us. So, just to end off, where can people find you? So um, we have a website, thedesign.co. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Nice, clean, simple. You can contact us through the website. We have all social media platforms. Search for us on the Instagram if you want to check out what we've been doing, The Design Co. UK. It's the same on Twitter and it's the same on Facebook. We love to have a chat. So all Formula Botanica customers we are 30 minutes three consultation if you just want to talk you know uh love to have a chat and i love hearing about exciting new businesses and we'd love to be part of it like i said check out our portfolio on our website and check out our social media if you go onto our website there is a useful essential guide to building a strong brand on our website that you can download for free it comes up on the bottom of the screen when you're scrolling down just sign up or drop me an email at rob at the design.co and I'm more than happy to send you a copy over. Fabulous. Thanks so much for joining us, Rob. Not a problem. Anytime. Thanks so much to Rob for joining us. And I hope that you enjoyed this podcast on branding and that you got some valuable information on it. We're going to be posting a second podcast that covers some different elements to branding. And I hope that you enjoy that one as well and that you come over and listen to it. If you want to find more out about Formula Botanica, you can check out our website at formulabotanica.com. If you want to find us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram at formulabotanica.com. If you want to weigh in on the conversation, come and join our online forum on Facebook, the Skincare Entrepreneur Mastermind Group. And if you want to drop us an email, you can just get in touch with us at hello at formulabotanica.com. Thanks so much for your time and I hope you enjoyed listening.